Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of the Canadian Immigration Live Q&A. This is the Express Entry Edition. Alicia will be back with me tomorrow as we answer all of your various Canadian immigration questions. However, today, this is really focused on the area that I love most, which is Express Entry. So any questions that you have whatsoever about the whole world of Express Entry, now is your time to fire away. Now, I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. And I have been at this for, well, if you're new to the live stream right now, probably about six years. It seems like it's been an eternity. When I first started doing these on my Facebook uh, page, I would then post them onto the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel just so that they would get a little bit better reach and easier to search. And those of you who are watching on YouTube, I strongly encourage you to go back and check out all of the past videos and just do a keyword search. Not as easy on Facebook. And those of you who are part of the Express Entry Law private Facebook group, we've been working on that one, getting it revived and, and going, you know, and basically resurrecting it because Facebook basically killed it, which is driving me crazy. And I'm trying to work with Meta to sort it out because there's 120,000 uh, subscribers to that channel. Anyways, if you're watching on LinkedIn, welcome over in Twitter or wherever else you're, you're tuning in, please give me a shout out. Let me know where you're listening from because that's one of the things that I love most about this process is being able to see how far out into the world this all goes. So grateful to have you guys here. This channel right here wouldn't be what it is without you. And we've been doing the same thing every week, 10 a.m. Mountain Time for, like I said, probably four years, five years, a long time. And it, this is the highlight of my week. I love connecting with you. I love hearing about your success stories. So if you've had a, a positive result, whether it was a study permit approved, whether you got your PR approved, whatever it is, I love to hear about that. And if you're past alumni of the Canadian Immigration Institute DIY courses, like the Express Entry course that is getting ready to launch you guys, once again, we are, if you go here and explore courses, you will see that the Express Entry Masterclass is starting on Monday of next week. So if you have not connected in yet, absolutely do that because I, I truly believe this is hands down the best training tool out there on how to successfully file your express entry application the first time. And when you add to all of the course material, the fact that this is a four hour over four days from 4 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Thursday, masterclass with myself where you get all of your questions answered in our private community group. So it's different than this, you guys, because within the course, we can dive into the specifics where we can't hear. And that reminds me, when you have a question, and if it's a specific question, you may hear, oh, you might not hear that. Let's turn up the sound. You may hear that. And that really means that your question is specific. And what I need you to do is to slide over to our channel right here and uh, click on speak to a lawyer and book an appointment to get proper legal advice. Now, I will do everything that I can, you guys, to try to make sure that I'm giving helpful information that's gonna benefit the most people on the channel. But if you are in a situation where you've got a really specific situation, um, I am loath to give any legal advice over this channel. Information, no problem. But when it comes to giving you specific advice to address your unique situation, you really need to slide over and book a consult. All right. So hopefully you guys are posting where you're tuning in from because I absolutely love to see that. So Eric is over in Cameroon. Welcome, Eric. It's great to have you here. Thanks for connecting into the channel. Let's see who else we have here. Um, let's see. We've got Priyanka here. Good to have you connecting in. Um, Oh, here we go. Let's see. We've got Umang says, um, hi, Mark. I have started following you quite recently. In fact, this is going to be my first live session. You people are doing great. Keep it up. Thank you so much. And I will hit that one there and give you an applause. So it's great to have you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, all right. And questions like this, Eric, we will address those in just a little bit. I want to give a big shout out to Jana over here on LinkedIn. Fantastic to see people connecting in. And Jenna, I will get connected to you as well. Um, uh, Adam, I guess. 
Uh, I will get connected to you as well and answer that question as soon as we do some more shout outs. Okay. But it's great to see that this is going out on LinkedIn and you guys are actually able to access it. All right, let's keep zipping through these and let's see who else we have here. Uh, Carla changed hairstyle. Well, hey, I got my hair cut. Away you go. This is how it rolls. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, Justin says, hey, Mark, good morning. Canada from Fort McKay. Good to see you back again, Justin. Great to have you here. Mary, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, we've got... Ituen, who's over in Ottawa listening in. Thanks, Ituen, for connecting with us. And then we've got a bunch of, of, of love that's being shared from RCO. Great to have you. Um, Nefemi's down in the States, down in Ohio. Great to have you connecting in from the uh, Estados Unidos, as we say in Portuguese. All right, let's see who else we've got here. Uh, we've got Carla, who's over in Victoria, BC. Hi, Carla. Thanks for connecting in. And let's see what else we have here. Uh, Joel's over in Ontario, Thunder Bay. Uh, and Adam is in, in Calgary. Excellent. I was just in Calgary yesterday with Igor and with Alicia. And I wonder, let's see here. Um, I'm going to get Igor to send me uh, the picture. Igor, I'm going to just send a message to him. Can you send the picture of the picture of us took yesterday and I am going to show it on the live there. Okay. See if Igor sends that back to me. And when he does, then I will post it. Okay. But I was up in Calgary. We had um, a special, special meeting to honor Igor. And actually I'm also going to post another one for him. Um, let's see here. There. And we see I've got some super chats coming in and we'll definitely get to that in just a second. We'll do a few more shout outs. And uh, Igor has started his articles with our firm. So he's officially an articling student, which is the last final step to becoming a lawyer. Now he can do virtually everything out there that, that, that I can do in terms of uh, um, uh, advising and helping people. And, uh, and it's all, um, I, I supervise Igor at, at, during his articles. So I'm really, really excited for him to finally be at that stage. Okay, Igor does not waste any time. So let's pull this out here and we're going to take, I'm going to pull this on the screen. Okay. So check this out, you guys. So let's pull this away. So this is the firm. All right. Moment of truth. This is, we were up there. There we go. So I'll just pull that picture up here on the screen. So there's Igor in his traditional Ukrainian shirt there. And then I'm hiding in the background. And then there's Prem, the intake specialist, if you talk to Prem. And then Alicia's in there too. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was great. The first time that we'd been able to get together since the pandemic. And I think many of you will probably remember we've had C uh, Cedric who started his own firm now, and we, uh, still work closely with Cedric, but he wanted to, to strike out on his own and, and, and run his own firm. And I'm really supportive of him. And then Chanel, some of you may also have worked with Chanel, who is a digital nomad. And she decided that she wanted to explore different opportunities. She's down in South America for quite a while. And so she's exploring some other opportunities. And so we are in full hiring mode. So if you know of an immigration lawyer who's looking for an opportunity with a phenomenal firm, um, we have got room for you. And uh, I'm really excited to, uh, yeah, to see. I've got an interview tomorrow with a lawyer and, and we're headed to Ottawa for our National Canadian Bar Association Conference. And Alicia is a co-chair. She's her and Kieran Sini, who's another immigration lawyer, uh, they put the conference together and we're really, really excited to see how, um, how that's all going to play out. Uh, it's the first in-person conference that the Canadian Bar Association's National Immigration Section has had since the pandemic. So really, really excited to be there. And we're going to head out, at least I will, May 31st here in a couple of weeks. And uh, it'll be great a great opportunity to connect with all the uh, other lawyers across the country all in one place. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. Excellent. All right. Let's see if uh, we can get Igor in here. And I think I've got, yeah, we'll wait for him to dial in and then I'll pull him in and, and then we can uh, just see what he has to say about, um, yeah, his starting articles with the firm. We'll address that as well. Okay, let's jump down and I'm going to do a couple more shout outs here. See if we have any more. Um, oh, Carla says, how much is the charges for the course? We'll fly, to, fly sort over here. So, um, so I think you guys know when it comes to speaking to us, 
Um, when it's a, a one-to-one -one consultation, Alicia and I charge $315 for a 25 minute consult. So that's what we, that's what we charge Alicia and I. Um, you, I just did a 50 minute consult with someone and I charged 630. That's inclusive of Alberta tax, the GST. When it comes to the course where, and I'll just give you a little bit of an overview on the express entry course, this course itself, if you click on the link in the description below, you'll be able to see exactly what's in the course. And you can, I'll scroll through all of this. We don't need to worry about any of those other details, but if you scroll all the way down here, you can see the entire content of the course. There's over 642 minutes, which is basically 10 hours of content. And then on top of it, four hours of the live masterclass. And it's the, la it's the masterclass. So all of these are on demand. If you subscribe now, which I recommend you do, you can start going through all the modules that walk you through every part of the entire express entry process learning the basics, starting your profile. This is basically determining your eligibility. Um, then uh, completing the actual profile for yourself as a principal, then completing the portions if you have an, an accompanying spouse. And the best part is you can choose what applies. If you're single, you, do, you can ignore this second part of module three. Um, if you're just an individual applicant. Uh, module four is after you get your ITA and all of the steps to complete even the, the additional sections. The contact details includes address instructions and the personal history section is completely new after you get your invitation to apply. Module four is if you have this part for a spouse, if you have a spouse and also sections for children. So you can see that the lessons are literally on demand. You pick and choose what you need what you need basically to review the most. This talks of module five is all about that goofy checklist. Sometimes you'll get this broken checklist and uh, figuring it out. This is submitting your EAPR and then how to properly respond to IRCC. This is a really important one. And then module six is all about mastering your documents. This is the one that is worth the most out of everything within the course because there is a section for every single document, a video explaining, sample documents, checklists, a whole bunch of things that you can use, templates to make sure that what you're presenting to immigration is truly uh, the strongest application that you can that'll give you the best chance of getting uh, your application um, successfully um, approved. So with all of this being said, like the, the masterclass itself goes May 22nd to the 25th every evening. And there's a place where you can post your questions if you can't make it live. It's all available as a recording. You can watch it later if you can't make it right at that time. But it's just a wonderful course. And um, I would literally hold it up there against anyone out there uh, who's produced or tried to produce anything like this. Now, the cost of it is, I'll just pull this up here, is $347. And then depending on where you're at, you can see I'm in Alberta, so it tacked on the, the sales tax for here. So depending on where you are in the world, uh, there may or may not be sales tax that is attributed to here, but um, you'll just enter your information in and uh, yeah, and then it will reflect. And this is in US dollars. Uh, this is in US dollars. So just remember that. Okay, so there's the cost. All right. Okay, we're just about through some of the shout outs. We've got CF who's in Montreal. Great to have you there. And uh, I'm just waiting for Igor to connect in. Um, let's see here. Okay. I'm just going to send uh, a little message to Igor here. <laughs> okay, we'll see if he can jump in here. Okay. All right, jumping back, let's see who else we have here. We've got Haiti. Uh, Haiti is uh, glad to watch live today. I'm watching from FSJ, Fort St. John, BC. <gasps> cool. I was up in Fort St. John in April, Haiti, and um, I was visiting my, uh, my uncle and my cousins up there. Um, Amara from Ivory Coast. I had a very good friend um, that uh, lives here in Lethbridge who served his mission for our church in Ivory Coast. So very cool. And we've got Nisha is over in Toronto. Hello, Nisha. Yusuf is over in Toronto. Hi, Yusuf. Great to have you here. Uh, let's see who else. Do, 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 do. We'll do a couple more. Um, oh, Spidey, good to see you. I hope you're healing up. I hope that torn, I think it was an ACL. You, you said, Spidey, that you, had, uh, that you had injured yourself. Hopefully that is healing up well for you. And um, let's see what else. Uh, and yes, um, and then... 
and in detail, we will get to your question as well. And it's great to see people on other platforms connecting in, especially LinkedIn, which is a great, great source. So we'll get to that one. And, uh, and Muhammad as well, I'm going to give you a shout out and I will answer these questions you guys over on LinkedIn. So it's great to have you connecting in. As you can see, Facebook, I don't see Facebook anywhere. Urgh, Facebook. Um, okay, we've got uh, Renee's over in Jamaica. And I think we're at the bottom of our shout out. So I think we are. Let's see. Uh, is there any others that I'm missing? Okay, looks like we're good. All right, so we will jump back now. And I think most of you probably are aware of the fact that there was a round of invitations that occurred just last, uh, just last week. And it was a PNP only. And there was just a small number of invitations. Um, but, uh, but we'll see what happens. I think probably will be another two weeks before we see something. All right. Looks like the man, the myth, the legend is going to be joining us here, Igor. So let's see if we can add him into our mix here. All right. Moment of truth. There he is. How you doing, Igor? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? I'm doing really good. Really good. So how do you feel? Finally, after this long, long journey, you finally entered into your articles. And maybe you can just explain what articles are for, for the people that are watching here on the channel. Yeah, it feels really great. And i um, super excited to start my articles. May 15th is the official start date. Um, articling in Canada is the required um, element of practice that you have to complete before you can um, get admitted to bar. So you have to spend one year working um, under supervision of a principal lawyer at a law firm, and then you will be eligible to um, be admitted to bar and actually become a lawyer. So technically, while you're articling, you perform all of the roles and duties of a lawyer. There are just some minor limitations. Um, for example, you cannot go to the Supreme Court or you cannot deal with certain criminal law matters. But overall, it's, um, it's just 100% similar to what a lawyer would do on a daily basis. Yeah. And I'll be honest, this is something that I wish the immigration consultants would do as well. I wish new immigration consultants would have to work under another uh, consultant or whatnot for at least a year so they could get you know, get some experience and get some exposure before they just race off helping people in ways that really have huge impacts on their life. But it is what it is. So any lawyers, notwithstanding the all of the years and years of education, the, you know, your master's in law that you got back in Ukraine and then coming and taking another full year, a year and a half almost of other postgraduate studies uh, at University of Calgary Faculty of Law and then writing exams all to you know to to reach this stage so um we're we're really really happy and you could have taken the easy road right igor you could have said well i'll just be an immigration consultant and just go down that path and, and then i don't have to worry about all these hoops that the law society is going to put me through but you said no you were going to do it and so how does it feel to to, to finally be here yeah it's looking back it looks um, easier than it was when I was like two years ago, looking forward. Um, looking back, it's, uh, you, you reflect on all of those years that you completed um, your, your bachelor's and then master's and then UFC and then exams and then all of the tens of thousands of dollars that you invested into this legal education. And it looks like it's manageable. Um, so I'm, I'm really content right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, speaking about um, actual process it's it's hard um and you're right mark it's um it's it would be good if immigration consultants would actually go through the same process uh because that would uh give them the practical uh tips and strategies you know that they can use in their practice mm -hmm. and um ironically like we got lots of messages from immigration consultants asking like hey how do i claim cpd credits which should be taught during the um, yeah. substantial education. Yeah. And just um, sometimes we get questions that you would never expect from a practicing practitioner. Um, yeah. So this is an essential element, I think. And um, I remember at one point we had a discussion with you whether I should um, just go with the easier route or yeah. go for the 
complicated route. And at that point, uh, because of all the complexities with getting admitted to this program, you know, and then passing the exams and then financial constraints, it was easier to actually become a consultant. And in the long run, I, I guess, like, we would have more opportunities, you know, because of um, less strict uh, regulation of the consultants. You can yeah. get referral fees. There are so many benefits. But <laughs> overall, if, if you look long term, you want to become a professional, not a money grabbing person, yeah. you know, just making money, you know, off people like the next day you finish the program. So you want to build expertise. You want to actually help people. And before you can take on someone's file, you want to be sure that you can actually help and not hurt that person. Absolutely. And you also don't want to be in a position where you're learning off of the backs of the clients whose applications get rejected, right? And sometimes that's what happens with some representatives that don't have the experience. They represent people. They don't understand the, the pitfalls and the problem areas that maybe are not readily visible when you're filing an application. They only come through through um, diligent study and, and research and, and experience. Um, and then the application gets rejected. And then guess what? Well, they learn not to do that next time, but that doesn't help the actual client that they were representing. So this is something that, uh, at least within the firm, we take very, very seriously. And the Code of Professional Conduct you know, requires us to be competent. And if we're not, then individuals can file complaints to the Law Society that are meaningfully addressed, which right now I'm not as sold on the, the third iteration of the Immigration Consultant Association. It's, it really doesn't have, um, I'm not seeing any measurable real measurable on the ground teeth for going after people for incompetence, for not doing things properly. Sure, if someone's stealing money or doing something in a grand scale fraud type of a situation, yes, because the RCMP and the other government you know, bodies are going to get involved because of the public embarrassment that it creates to the system. But individually, I can't tell you how many times I've had individuals come to me who really received advice that just wasn't great. And, uh, and it, it harmed them to their detriment. And often there's not a lot that we can do to fix it. So um, anyways, those are, those are some of the, the, the challenges. And we, we know a lot of immigration consultants out there that are really good at what they do. And a lot of them come and take our courses. And uh, this is part of the, the benefit, too, of the Express Entry courses, the CPD accredit that, uh, accreditation that comes for uh, through CICC uh, as a result of the courses. So we're here to help and, and educate, uh, but also do what we can from our standpoint to just warn people that you have to be careful. Not all representatives are created equal. And so I'm really, really delighted to have you make the decision, Igor, to become a lawyer. And uh, it was not just time and effort, but it was significant cost. You know, you think at how much you had to pay for just one year of, of school at U of C, which was brutally expensive. And um, just to arrive at the stage. So we can't wait for one year from, you know, today where you can officially get called to the bar and, and, uh, and go forward with that. Yeah. Yeah. And Mark, I consider myself lucky. Like I, it's in my nature to complain a lot. I feel sometimes, <laughs> but um, sometimes when I look at those $30,000 that I had to pay for one year of education, I'm like, oh my God, bless us so much. Because um, from my background in Ukraine, I finished my law school bachelor's and master's and it probably cost me like less than $5,000 total because I was studying for free and I was getting an allowance from the government. So I did not pay anything. It's just the living expenses. So thinking about this large cost, um, it makes me sad <laughs> that I had to pay so much. But on the other side, if I compare myself to local graduates um, who have to pay let's say $20,000 for one year of bachelor's, and then let's say 15000 for a master's, and then 15000 for PhD. So that's like over $1, $100,000 that they have to invest. And then finding articlings, um, it's not easy. It takes time. And then sometimes they don't get paid at all. So I consider myself extremely lucky in this situation. And um, yeah, so I'm super, super... Um, I, I feel it's going to be an exciting year. Um, I have lots of ideas and uh, projects as to how we can improve the firm and how I can contribute and um, help other people. And um, speaking about um, another difference between consultants and lawyers um, that I'm not sure if the public is aware, um, lawyers are held to a high standard of, um, of conduct 
not only in their professional life, but um, in their personal lives as well. And um, there are several situations, numerous situations, I mean, that even you, if you're doing something stupid outside your profession, you can get disbarred. Yeah. And so when you're dealing with lawyers, you um, will, on most occasions, I'm not saying on all occasions, because there are some bad lawyers as well. Yes. And we have to acknowledge this. On most yeah. occasions, you will deal with a person who understands um, that he's maintaining the reputation of the profession in his everyday life as well. So um, there are, there's like this standard of not just like, oh, lawyers won't charge me for something that they shouldn't. It's, it's like how the lawyer will actually treat the other human being. And that um, even if his moral side is not as sophisticated as to like being too respectful, there are some constraints by the law society that requires him to actually be a good representative for the profession. So this is yeah. another just point, uh, like food for thought for those people who choose between hiring a lawyer and a consultant. Yeah. And I'm not saying consultants are not regulated and that's why they're not as um, diligent and uh, professional mm -hmm. and kind people in their lives. There are beautiful consultants, beautiful people out there yeah. as well. Absolutely. But, there's also like this line in the yeah. in the regulation that requires you, and this is a big deal, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Those are good points, Igor. And yeah, just to reiterate, yeah, we we definitely have some good friends that are great consultants, and and the sad part is that I'm overrun <laughs> with people who have used consultants that are not as good, and uh, and then trying to sort things out and help them and fix things and correct things and. You know, I love nothing more when I see immigration consultants and lawyers who go the extra mile to take extra courses, to get up to speed, to really, really know the law and the policy and the regulations. And uh, that's really, that's where my respect lies with people. And I can see very quickly when someone uses a, a consultant and even law firms where they're, they're pushing everything down to their paralegals at a consult just the other day where um, I think they chose the wrong knock code for the work permit. And I had to tell the individual, look, you need to go back to that firm and you need to sort this out because you can't use that knock code on your work permit for express entry because I don't think you're performing those duties. And it was just a matter of just taking on too many files, right? And so it's not unique to, to consultants, lawyers, it happens as well. If they're the individuals within the firms are, are not properly supervised, um, but it all comes down to whether or not you truly care. And I think that's one of the things within our firm, Igor, that we've really tried to help people understand is that we do. And, uh, you know, because of that, when I flip over to our website and I look at the, you know, the reviews, you know, uh, so Nitin put this review in, uh, you know, one of the best people I've come across and he was facing a bunch of issues here. And, you know, you can go in and you can read what our, you know, what, what individuals are saying about, about the firm. And, um, and we take great pride in our 4.9% rating. And I'll tell you once again, you guys, that if you, if you, you know, if you're wondering, well, why isn't it five? Well, any firm, any place that does, that has a five-star rating, I think there's something fishy about that because there are consults that I have with people that I know are lying, that had, have not told the truth, or they don't like the advice that I'm giving them and aren't happy with the consult. But I will never, ever tell someone what they want to hear. I will give them advice that they can actually rely upon. And if I see someone who's trying to cheat the system or abuse the system, I call them on it. And people don't always like that either. So, you know, obviously we're going to get one star reviews from people and that's just to be, to be expected. But uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're so, so excited to, to be here and, and able to support the immigration community. And uh, yeah, Igor, it's great to have you as a part of the team. And we'll see as we continue to grow. I was telling them that we're, you know, we're looking for other immigration lawyers as well to join our team. And Cedric and Chanel made huge contributions to the firm when they were here. And it's wonderful. I'm so grateful for, for what they did. And, and I'm so excited for them as they go on and pursue other, other interests and other ventures. And let's face it, you know, immigration isn't for everyone. And, uh, and so it, sometimes you, you have to experiment and see what you like. And they're both, yeah, and Cedric has started his own firm and we're happy to continue to support him and, and, uh, and work closely with him on files. And he provides a service that is just, yeah, really, really good. So we're happy with him. And Ch Chanel's going to pursue other ventures outside of maybe even outside of the law. So, um, that, you know, we just, we love, you know, everything that people bring to the firm. So we're excited to see where you're going to go, Igor. And this is a good segue into something that I want to let people know about. So if you go to our firm website here, you'll see podcast at the top. 
And then at the top here, you'll see that, uh, that it takes you to the Canadian Immigration Podcast link. And uh, so Alicia and I just released this one, but Igor and I are putting together um, a series of episodes directed specifically to the QUET program and, you know, things that no one is talking about, big problem areas, and just, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so definitely go and check those out as well as um, our uh, immigration or impossible Canadian trivia and a bunch of other podcasts podcasts while you're traveling. So make sure that you, if you haven't subscribed on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast and, uh, and, and definitely take advantage of, of that. All right. Well, Igor, do you want to stick around and answer a few questions uh, with, with me or do you want, do you have some other things you have to do to drop off? I can do either way. Um, sure. I can stick Here. with you. And... Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, um, We'll work together on it. Okay, I'm going to pull up Super Chat that's been waiting here from Eric. So Eric says, uh, in my express entry application, I saw medical passed, biometrics updated, and the candidate number changed into a real UCI. Can I be sure I passed R10 completeness check? Well, generally speaking, when you're filing an express entry application, yes, they're going to be looking at to see if your documents actually are the documents that they're asking for. And when it comes to the R10 completeness, this is something that people, I think, are un, unaware of the, the distinction between this and, say, the TR to PR pathway program. So for express entry, if you're missing any document, they just say, oh, it's incomplete and we're sending it back. And with express entry, it's quite rare that that happens for the simple reason that it's so regimented in what you upload and it, you can't actually upload it unless you've completed all of the boxes and you've uploaded something into the sections that they've asked for. So it's quite rare that you don't actually have an R10 completeness. But let's say you updated a black and white color of a uh, copy of a German police clearance instead of a color copy. Well, that can get it rejected for being incomplete. So um, I'm, I, I can't say, Eric, that yes, 100% <laughs> that it's passed. But uh, yes, but obviously, um, they're, they're, you know, whenever a, a file number is changed to a real UCI, it's one indicator and when it comes to the medical and, and biometrics, those kinds of things, well, you don't usually get to those stages unless the R10 has been completed. So I say, generally speaking, Eric, yes, that's a, possi that's a possibility. Um, but I don't put too much stock in the current um, status history updates and those things within your uh, IRCC secure account. Everything is still kind of a mess. So, uh, so that's kind of how we'll tackle, tackle that one. Okay, I've got another one here, another, see if I can find the actual question. Okay, so this one is from Yuander, who's up in Calgary, and it's a two-part question, looks like. So here's the first one. My employer would like to support my PNP AOS application in Alberta. Unfortunately, they provided only the job offer letter recommendation uh, letter and been working with them for a year. Do they need to provide an LMIA? I am currently holding uh, a spousal open work permit, which is not qualified in AOS. So this is a very, very tricky question. And it's one that we, we get quite commonly, being that we're located in Alberta. The Alberta Opportunity Stream, Igor, this is something that you have actually just done. Your own little episode on your YouTube channel, I think. Have you, did you covered Alberta Opportunity Stream um, uh, and, and it was for the Ukraine audience. And so, um, you can, what is your YouTube channel, Igor? What's it called? Your Ukraine one. Oh, it's, you probably um, can't, uh, my it, first name and last name. It's, it's very oh, there hard. There you to, go. Okay. Okay. So to. you guys can find it. You, you, those of you who, who, uh, who speak Ukrainian, you can search for Igor and, and, and find his channel and, and watch that video. But what are your thoughts on this, Igor? So this person has an open work permit, but it's not a post-grad. So we know right off the bat for the Alberta Opportunity Stream that when it comes to qualifying work history for the AOS, it has to be employer specific. And I hear, I wonder if there's a little bit of background noise, Igor, where you're at. I'm just wondering if it's me or if it's maybe, maybe you, I think it's okay. Um, so if it's Alberta Opportunity Stream, employer-specific work permits, LMIA-based or under the International Mobility Program, employer-specific are all good to go. But when it comes to open work permits, uh, spousal open work permits are not eligible. So if you're on a spousal open work permit, Igor, what options would, you know, there's kind of a hint here at this, um, but is what do you think about the LMIA? 
Um, my understanding is um, because a uh, spousal open work permit does not fall under the exemption for those who need the LMA, they need an LMA. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's as simple as that. And so, yeah, if you want to go through the Alberta Opportunity Stream, you actually do need to um, get an LMIA-based work permit. It, it needs to be uh, under that um, that regime. And just sliding back here to the uh, to the actual uh, Canadian Immigration Podcast right now, Alicia and I have a very detailed and uh, series. And maybe Igor, we can just change that name to identify it as uh, Business Immigration Series. But this business immigration series, we're going through and talking about LMIAs and each step along the way. Um, uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of you know top four reasons LMIAs are refused and then where do companies go wrong with LMIAs. So definitely uh, you want to go back and watch, uh, sorry, listen to those videos that Alicia and I have done on, uh, on the LMIA process. But yeah, it's not, it's not easy. And many employers, when they realize what they have to do, struggle a little bit because of the complexities. But um, but yes, you enter, that is the, that's the path that you're going to take um, because being on a spousal open work permit, you're not eligible to go through AOS. Now, with that being said, there's nothing stopping you from creating an express entry profile and indicating, you know, that you are working in Alberta. And there's one other little tip that I'll throw out. Now, if you're going through the express entry process, and this is something that no one is talking about. There's a question in the work history section that says, do you have a job offer? Now, for the purposes of express entry, a job offer is restricted to employer-specific LMIA. So it, uh, a permanent LMIA, we call it, that's used just to support permanent residence, an LMIA to support a work and permanent residence, or someone who's worked for one year in Canada on an employer-specific work permit under the International Mobility Program, for example. So those three categories, you have to hit on one of those in addition to the company saying, yes, we'll keep a job open for uh, you and or, um, for at least a year after they become permanent resident. That's kind of the requirements. But one thing people don't realize is that sometimes the provinces are looking to see you know, who has a job offer um, and that job offer may be according to their requirements and not IRCC. So lately, I've been advising clients to say yes to the question of whether or not they have a job offer. And then when you answer those questions, if you're on a purely open work permit, like a postgrad or otherwise, when you say, you know, when it asks the question, is your work, your, your job offer employer specific, does your work permit, you know, have an actual named employer on it? If you answer no, then Express Energy doesn't give you points. But those provinces may look at it and say, hmm, this person has a job offer and be willing to extend a notification of interest to you. So you're not going to hear about that anywhere because no one's talking about that. And, you know, it's not like it's some magical little tool that's going to get you a notification of interest when the province isn't interested in you. But if you're living there, maybe on a spousal open work permit and you answer the questions and you're working for an employer who is willing to give you a job offer for one year after you become a permanent resident, then maybe, maybe you answer yes in your express entry profile and then just make sure you answer all the questions properly, which will exclude you from those extra CRS bonus points. But when it comes to the, uh, the province, no matter which province, maybe that will be one little factor that will cause them to say, hey, this is someone that we might want to extend a notification of interest to go through one of the express entry streams. So something to think about that, you know, I've just been mulling over just recently and uh, so definitely take that into consideration. All Mark, right. I'm and I've also pull, sent oh, you... Yeah, go ahead, Igor. Link. Um, I also sent you the link to the Alberta Opportunity Stream um, eligibility requirements. And there is a list of who's exempt from an LMIA requirement. So let's slide down here. And you can see when it comes to, um, when it comes to the requirements, and we won't go through all of these, but all you have to do is go through to the Alberta Opportunity Stream, the eligibility factors... And then in here, it talks about the, the types of, um, uh, you know, eligible job offers right here. You can see what they're looking for in terms of, of, of the actual job offer. And uh, yeah, the, the LMIA Mark, requirement. A, yep, go at, ahead, Igor. At the top, it's, it's just a little at the top, um, almost at the very top of the page. Um, they give a list of exactly who is exempt from LMIA. So it's just right here. Yeah, right here. Boom. Okay. And so these ones, if you fit into these, then you're okay. And let's see, where does it, does it have Ukraine, Kuwait on here, Igor? 
I think it, it does mention. Um, I'm trying to remember yeah, if they do because I know that bottom. you know you're on an open work permit that's a quet uh, supported work permit that uh, that Alberta yeah. will continue to consider you. But um, I'm not sure if they've officially yeah. updated here on yeah, yeah right here they did. an open work permit issued under this program also uh, works. So um, yes. So there we go. All right, okay, we'll slide back here and uh, let's dive into some more questions here from our, our listeners. Um, let's see what we have. Okay, I told Adam that I would address this one. So my brother recently married a girl from Sierra Leone in the States. He's a dual citizen of Canada and in, in the US. She has a student visa and would like to eventually get her dual citizenship. What would the process be? Can she do both simultaneously or should she have to do one or and then the other? Okay, so let's see. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. So the girl from Sierra Leone is in the United States. He's a dual citizen of Canada and the U.S. She has a student visa, I'm assuming, to the U.S. And so um, can she do both simultaneously? Okay, I'm not sure, Adam, if the question relates to uh, a U.S. entry or a Canadian one. So if we speak from the standpoint of Canada... Um, there's, you know, if they are married or they meet the one law, uh, one year common law, then, you know, then your brother could sponsor her to, uh, to come to Canada. And there's no restriction on what she, whatever she's doing in the U.S. They don't really care. The, the key is that, um, that she meets the definition of a spouse under the family class. And then you can do a spousal sponsorship, your brother can. Um, you know, other than that, I'm not sure if she's studying. I don't think she's studying in Canada. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's probably the route that I would advise. But as always, we ring that bell and say, slide over and book a consult and we can sort that out. Have your brother book a consult with us and we can, uh, we can sort all of that out, uh, so that there's no, um, yeah, we, we've got a good plan in place, I guess, going forward. All right. Okay. Let's see who's next on our list here. Um, Okay, this person says, visitors to work permit is possible in Alberta, Canada. I do not advise anyone to come to Canada to visit and then apply for a work permit. Um, the Coots port of entry in particular, which is the main port of entry people go to, routinely find that people have potentially misrepresented their intention when they came as a visitor when they very quickly after apply for a work permit, an LMIA-based work permit at the port of entry. So I've seen so many people train wrecks with that situation. So I just simply advise against it. Legally, can a person who's a visitor leave Canada, do a loop around the pole, flagpole, and apply for a work permit at the port of entry? <clears throat> In some cases, yes, they can. But having been a former immigration officer, a border officer in particular, who worked just next to Coots and on the Alberta, uh, um, the Alberta Montana border at the Carway Port of Entry in Chief Mountain, I can tell you that it's a very volatile thing here in Alberta and other provinces might be kinder at those ports of entry. But yeah, if you come as a visitor and then apply for your work permit just to try to get around maybe lengthy processing times in your home country or a more, um, a more stern, you know, uh, a more picky kind of work permit adjudication process that could result in a refusal. Sometimes people will try to avoid those and then just do it at the port of entry. Well, you might get a quick response, but you may not like that response. So we always advise to be careful with that. Okay. Um, okay. Mang says, I have a few queries regarding Express Entry and PP. I'll be asking the session today. Thanks in advance. Okay, great. Let's see what else we have here. Um, so human, I love this. Okay. We have a human who's watching. This is fantastic. Exciting. Must I have required proof of funds for Express Entry since post IT application until I arrive in Canada? So Igor, what do you think about the proof of funds situation? So if someone has their proof of funds when they file their EAPR, and so this says since post ITA, I'm assuming since post filing the EAPR, it says, do they need to have those funds until they ultimately arrive in Canada? What do you think? I think or they can should they keep spend the, the money and just ignore it and uh, not worry about the funds after they've already filed their EAPR? What do you think? They should they should keep the funds and they have to be readily available at any time. So if your application is approved tomorrow and you land the day after tomorrow, you should still have the funds and you should not borrow those funds from anyone else. So yes, keep the funds in your account. Yeah. And during the pandemic, we saw people who depleted their funds. 
who had to live on them. And I saw specific requests at the passport request stage or just prior to it where they said, we need you to get an up updated medical, immigration medical, and we want proof that you still have the funds that you said you had in the EAPR. And the second place is always at landing. An officer can always ask when you're completing your landing process if you still have those funds and to demonstrate them because that's your obligation. So so human, yes, yes. All right, here's, a, here's one. And, you know, this is a good one, Igor, because you kind of fall into this category yourself. Well, not fully this category, but... This Eric says, I have a problem. I have a misrepresentation to the U.S. Can I apply for my study permit to Canada? So we don't know if Eric is actually in the U.S. or if it was just applying for a visa to go to the U.S. But Canada and U.S. have information sharing agreements, don't they, Igor? Yeah. And uh, before we start answering this question, uh, tip, the, the, the biggest tip you can ever get is um, you never want to hide it and you want to be straightforward and come clean. When you apply to Canada, you then never want to avoid telling about your refusal or misrep in U.S. And you want to be as as honest as possible. But um, when it comes to temporary residence, Canada will certainly take this into account, and um, they will not be so keenly uh, approving the application, um, knowing that you have misrepresented in the past, and they they might have to their own. Uh, yes. So when you apply for permanent residence, I'm not exactly sure if the implications will be as grave, but you still have to report it and declare. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's any refusal, you're gonna you're gonna explain. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see what's next here as we sip through all of our questions. I'm trying to pull out ones that will be the most benefit to the most people. Um, Okay, we get a lot of these ones, Umang. So Umang says, my passport and my PR holder sibling in Canada have a little difference in my father's name. Her passport has father's surname as well that's missing with mine. How to show sibling relationship proof. This is something we see all the time, um, Umang, especially coming from India and countries like that where really they're not too picky about spelling and names. And there's so many errors. I would say probably 75% of the work that... Uh, um, yeah, that I do for uh, Indian clients, there's probably 75% of them have problems with the spelling in some form or other. And uh, so we don't get too worried about that stuff, but we do make sure that we explain in the letter of explanation the differences. And we point it out. And I had this discussion, Igor, with a, a client this morning where they booked a 50-minute consult. And we talked at length about, do you disclose things that you think might be a problem? And I always, always advise people to do it. So don't like just hope the officer doesn't find out. Tell them about the problem area in advance and then explain it because you want to be the person who is formulating the opinion for the officer and not allowing them to make their, their own opinion of the situation. And uh, I think I'm going to do a special video on that topic um, and, and release it just how to, you know, tips to strengthen your application that no one is talking about. And that's, I think, what we're going to tackle in, in an upcoming video, because there are little things that you can do that will really help an officer to believe you and to give you, um, you know, the benefit of the doubt and uh, really just to see your credibility increase with that officer. So there's little simple things that you can do. Yeah, and I wanted to add, if you hide something or fail to disclose it, they may not notice this when you apply for permanent residence, but they might notice this when you apply for Canadian citizenship five or 10 years down the road. So you never want to just hope that, oh, they will miss it. They will not notice the discrepancy. They might miss it, but they might not as well later on. Mm -hmm. This one is awesome. Here's David. What the heck do you have in your hand, David? I got, <laughs> what does he... I got to blow this up, guys. I got to see, what has he got? <laughs> What the heck is he? <laughs> David's working on a farm out here in Alberta. He's a farm guy. So I don't know what he got here. Something he's got. Maybe it's a badger or something. Anyways, who's 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 um attacking all the gophers or who knows? Anyways. <clears throat> but David, uh, he just he just says here, good morning, Mark. I'm still your faithful follower. So David, we're just crossing our fingers, waiting on 
this perma resin to be approved. He said, I'm still your faithful follower. Finally finished to listen to all of your podcasts. Can you imagine that, Igor? <clears throat> and so a lot of the content in our podcast episodes is what we call evergreen. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's the topics are ones that are beneficial to, to virtually anyone. And so if you go back historically and we look at all of the past episodes of the, um, uh, of the Canadian immigration podcast, you can see we're up to it like a hundred. And we started really kicking things back into high gear here in February um, with the, with the release of, of number 100. But before that, you know, we've got just a ton of, of, uh, of episodes on all kinds of different types of, um, of immigration topics, uh, Canadian immigration po- topics, everything, you know. Uh, and so I strongly encourage you to go back and, and just binge them. Just enjoy, enjoy the content because a lot of it is still applicable today. So David, shout out to you, my friend. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Okay, Justin says, just want to confirm if I'm on a student permit and got a work permit through LMIA, can work full time for the specific employer. Well, you have to make up your mind, Justin. And this is one where this is exactly one of these ones here, right, Igor? I'm going to ring it again here because this is the type of thing we really need you to book a consult for because I can't give you advice on that um, without having a more detailed discussion with you uh, just basically regarding the 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 specific facts of your situation um i would be loath to actually say hey yeah there's no problem when i don't understand all of the details so make sure that you slide over here and all you have to do is click on speak to a lawyer and it'll be really really easy to just choose a time slot that works for you and uh, and then we can address those for you all right we've got we're just about out of time this one went really really fast today Let's see if we can find some other ones. Um, okay, Sudeep asks a good express entry question because, you know, realistically, work history is one of the areas that we struggle with the most with our clients. So for reference letters, if an employer states on mail that they cannot provide a reference letter as per their policy, then is notarized letter from manager in personal capacity justified? This is a perfect question. And I'm going to show you guys. This is another thing that is specifically addressed in the Canadian Immigration Institute, the Express Entry course. And I'm going to log in here and I'll show you our work history section. So this is something that we cover in here. And so when I log in to our actual course here, we'll see if I can find it right here. And we go to module six, which is the, I personally think it's the best module. Well, they're all great, but this is just chock full of helpful information. You will see here records of employment. And in here we have, you know, over you know, 30 different sample reference letters that you can see from, but you'll also see I have a specific document that says, what if I can't get a reference letter? We've got a record of employment checklist that you can give to your employer to get the proper reference letter. We've got samples, we've got our knock selection tool, we've got a bunch of things, but what if I can't get a reference letter? This document right here, that is one that we specifically put together to address this situation. So Sudeep, can you get a notarized, you know, you know, letter from a manager it, you know, to, to supplement or to, um, to place in lieu of an actual letter from the employer. Well, sometimes that's all you have available. Your job and onus is to respond to exactly what IRCC asks you to provide. And if you have an employer who's uncooperative, which is common with larger, you know, IT and other institutional like banks and stuff like that sometimes, well, banks, they will usually provide something, but it won't be very good. But with the, um, especially IT or big companies, like they know if you're applying for permanent residence, they could lose you. So often they have policies not to provide them because they're jerks. And it's as simple as that. They don't, you know, they want to keep you, hold your ransom so you, you can't get PR and then work for someone else. But ultimately, Sudeep, the onus is on you to provide it. So we have a hierarchy of things that we treat as being more persuasive or more probative in, from an evidentiary standpoint than others when you're submitting your application. And a notarized letter from a manager who's currently working for that company is one of the best alternative options when you're in this type of a situation. Sometimes people have, you know, maybe at the bottom end of the list, a coworker that used to work with you at the company that's no longer there. Well, that would be a whole lot less persuasive than a manager who's actually working there that provides, you know, the information. And when it's notarized, that's better than one that isn't because you're swearing that the information is true. So that's a great question, Sudeep. It's one we cover in length in the, in the course. And 
those of you who are tuning in um, just recently or just now at the tail end of the Express Entry, um, our, our little DI, our, our um, Q&A today, I just want to remind everybody that we have our DIY course that is kicking in on Monday. So this is the last opportunity for you to connect in, subscribe, watch the lessons, because our masterclass will start Monday the 22nd to the 25th. One hour every evening, we will be um, answering all of your questions um, just to supplement everything that you're learning in the Express Entry course. So get in there. All you have to do is uh, click on subscribe, enroll now. Start watching those videos now so that you can pull together your questions that you have. Uh, so during the Q&A, it's really giving you everything that you could possibly want um, and that there's no stone unturned. All right. Well, our time, because I have another consult right after this, is pretty much up. Looks like I've hit all the super chats at this stage. And I know that we didn't get through as many questions this time as possible because we're celebrating Igor here and his uh, his uh, launch of his articles here with the firm. Um, let's see here. I do have one Facebook. I'll hit one Facebook and one LinkedIn at the end here. So if, if someone got a West report in India, first professional degree in law, Juris Doctorate, what will be the equivalency in Canada? Is it a master's or a bachelor's? So um, this really comes down, this is, um, and, in, uh, and indeed, uh, this is where I'd really want to see the actual West report and to see what was stated there. In some cases, Juris Doctorate would be considered to actually be, you know, first professional degree in law. Um, you know, I, I want to see exactly what your uh, credential was and what West said, you know, what their ultimate um, uh, evaluation was, right? That's really what it comes down to. Um, there's a difference between a PhD, uh, you know, a professor and, um, you know, a, a JD, Juris Doctorate, which is clearly aligned with that of um, uh, the Juris Doctorate that we have in Canada. So, yeah, I don't know. I'll be honest. If it's considered to be a professional and a lawyer, then it would be equivalent to a master's or a professional. But, uh, yeah, I need more information on that one um, uh, and Indita. Uh, and then let me just pull up here. I know I have another... Uh, we've got Moid here over on, on LinkedIn. Great to see you. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to see if I've got another. I did have another LinkedIn that I wanted to hit so that we could get people in each of the sections. Okay, let's see. Okay, Muhammad says, what are the ways to convert to a work permit for an Indian after visiting there? Okay, well, this fits right into the, the issue that I was talking about. It's always dangerous to do this because if you come and you apply for a visitor visa and you say, I'm just coming to visit. When in reality, the company already has an LMIA in place. And then you go to the border and you apply for a work permit. I've seen many port of entry officers say, hey, uh, it looks to me like you may be misrepresented the real nature of your visit to Canada, that you were actually coming to work. And then they issue, uh, basically, they, they engage removal proceedings. Now, they will often issue uh, uh, something called an allowed to leave and a deferral of removal uh, um, and uh, deferral of examination. And then they say, look, you have to pack your plane and head out. So you have to be very, very careful with this, Muhammad. I don't like this. I, don't, I really don't advise people to do this, um, notwithstanding the timing. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, converting to a work permit um, from, uh, you know, a visit, it, you know, it's legally, it's possible. I just, I really, really shy away from that. I, I never want to put my clients in a position where, sure, they might get a quick result, but they may very well not like that result at all. All right. Let's see here. I'm just looking to see if there's any other last minute ones we can hit on um, from LinkedIn. We've got some other... Uh, we got some, I'll hit this one from Facebook. Ulu says, if I eventually get the 600 points and I get an ITA, will I be drawn under the CEC or PNP? Well, yeah, it's highly likely that, well, understand an ITA is unrelated to PNP in and of itself. But with 600 points, um, okay, if I eventually get the 600 points, okay, 600 comes from uh, PNP. So if you get your nomination, then yes, you will, because they will do PNPs as you've seen. No program specified as well as PNP related draws. Um, will I be drawn under the CEC or PNP? Well, it just depends on which program. If you're in Canada working, um, then you will be drawn under the CEC category because you have to be eligible under one of those, either the CEC, the Federal Skilled Worker, the Federal Skilled Trade Programs to 
to uh, go through one of the PNP streams. So you will be drawn onto one of those. Um, but if there's a round of invitation that is focused exclusively on PNP, then you will get drawn under that with your nomination. Or if it's no program specified draw, you will also get nominated under there. Uh, you could receive that nominate uh, that invitation. And it's entirely possible that if you have that one year of Canadian work experience that you could also be drawn under the CEC as well. So there's probably all of the above would be an appropriate answer. All right. Okay, well, let's wrap it up. And it looks like Anandita says, thanks, Mark. You're very, very welcome. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to turn on our little see you later music. Igor, any last comments or thoughts as we wrap up our, our live stream today? And I slide over to my console, which I'm three minutes late for now. Yeah, just uh, good luck, everyone, with their uh, immigration journeys. And uh, I hope I'll be a more frequent guest to these live Q&As. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, everybody, take care. And uh, don't forget to join me in the Express Entry course. Take care.